Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, good morning. This episode is brought to you by Arizona Hearing Center, where we help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss and to connect better with their friends and family and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. First, to the hearing loss from the radiation to his brain tumor, and then again from the tumor itself. We are at Arizona Hearing Center, where we only take care of ears. I am the E of ENT. I performed over 10,000 surgeries and taken care of many thousands of patients with hearing loss. I'm the author of a book called Listen Up. Listen Up, a physician's guide to effectively treating your hearing loss. You can find the book at www.listenuphearing.com. And if you wanna learn more about the practice, you can go to www.azhear.com. Today, I'm really excited. The people I have on it are part of my team, my audiology team at the practice at Arizona Ear Center. I have Dr. Lindsay Tucker and Dr. Rachel Goffney. They are my awesome audiologists. They are spectacular and they're here today. We're gonna to talk about the 60-60 rule. So I'm gonna let them tell their own story. I'm gonna start with Lindsay. Lindsay, tell me, how did you get into audiology? So I took the back road to audiology. Um, my background is in dance. So um, I grew up dancing. And so my background is vestibular. Um, that's what all my research is in. And then when I worked at Idaho State, they asked me to take over the cochlear implant clinic. And I did. And I did that for 10 years. And now I'm here. Yeah, yeah she's great. She's leading our, the, the two of them are leading our cochlear implant program. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today, about cochlear implants and the criteria for that. And uh, Rachel, uh, maybe you'll give us a little bit more detail than Lindsay does. Um, tell me your story to audiology. <laughs> Lindsay's story okay, is like, so um, I became an audiologist and uh, I was a dancer and now I'm an audiologist. Which is a great story. I yeah, know I'm going to cut a lot of like the horse breaking and yeah, rodeo you, out. <laughs> you, you were able to take classes, so you tried audiology because you were faculty, and then yeah. you know, it's a good one. Go ahead. Okay. She doesn't want to tell the story. It's okay. She doesn't want to tell the full story today. Yeah. That's, fine. That's fine. So when I went to college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So my college had an exploratory studies major where they brought in deans and faculty every Friday from all the different majors. And the speech pathology dean came in and she looked at my personality test. She's like, hey, just take a class, see if you liked it. I took phonetics it was my first class and I absolutely hated it. <laughs> and so I was like, this is not for me. So I went to tell the dean that this is just not what I was going to do. And the audiology professor was there and he said, hey, wait until next semester when you take my class and see if you like that better. And so I took his class and I was still wasn't like super sure. And he's like, you do realize that you're get, catching on a lot faster than a lot of people in the class. And there's other things to do besides just hearing aids. So then I kind of explored this whole world of like cochlear implants and more of the medical side of audiology. And that's really where I started to fall in love with it. Well, the beauty and is our one year both. anniversary is coming up. Yo, this is great. And and what I will tell you is that you guys are both awesome audiologists. You do a great job. Uh, you really instill a lot of confidence and take great care, care of patients. So, you know, we have a great cochlear implant program and that's because of you guys. Um, you know, I think we do a great job taking care of patients. And, and so, as you both know, there are a lot of people out there who are likely cochlear implant candidates who they don't know. And maybe the people taking care of their hearing don't know. So, what I wanted to explore was, uh, you know, some of the stuff in terms of there being some publications and us kind of adopting what they call the 60-60 rule. Can one of you guys uh, tell us about the 60-60 rule? Absolutely. Okay. You want to do that? So the 60-60 okay. guideline is a new guideline that came out of Michigan where they did a bunch, bunch of research. They brought in uh, over 500 people. And they tested them um, if they were a cochlear implant candidate. And then they did a retrospective study and looked back at their original audiogram that they came in with. And they found a very strong correlation between patients who had a 60 dB PTA or higher, along with a 60% word rec or lower, were good cochlear implant candidates based on testing. Okay, so let's talk about that. So a 60 dB PTA, that means a 60 dB pure tone average. So, you know, if somebody, is, you know, I'm watching this podcast and I want to break out my hearing test. What do they do? So they look at certain frequencies. So what are the frequencies they look at? 
500, 1,000, and 2K. 2,000. So, 2000. so they add those yeah. all up, right? Yep. And then you're going to divide by three. So the value of how much you have to turn up the volume on the graph, right? So if it's like, right, right. Uh, you know, 70, 70, and 65, you add those up. I'm not going to do the quick mm -hmm. math, although I think it's 205. <laughs> And then you divide yes. it by three to get what would be called the pure tone average, correct? Yes, correct. So That's correct. If that number is greater than what, does that make them a cochlear implant? 60. Okay. And so it actually doesn't make them a cochlear implant candidate. It makes it somebody who should be evaluated as a cochlear implant candidate, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. And then the second 60 rule is if, tell me about that. Okay. So we want to evaluate their word recognition scores, like at the best. So how do you do that test? Like best aided. Yeah. So we're going to evaluate that at the best aided condition. No. I and mean, if that's the 60, 60 rule on their audiogram, right? So that's not aided. So you're going to. Right. So it's gonna, not aided, but it's going to be like at a comfortable that's level to okay. them. So how does that test? So I have, I have a 75 or I have a 65 dB pure tone average and you've already done that test. Okay, now you're testing me. How do you do that That other, that percentage? What does that mean? How do you do that test when you guys are doing your awesome stuff in the booth? So we're going to do that at 40 dB above that level, okay. if that's comfortable for you. You make it louder, right? Yes. And then what do you do? And then we're going to see how you do at that level. But you so, read your list of words, or what does it entail? So it's a... It's basically a word. So the man says, say the word dog, and you would have to repeat back dog. There's no context clues. There's no sentence. There's no, no visual speech cues. reading or anything. Right? So no speech reading or anything like that. So a lot of people find that test very difficult because they don't have any context clues to go off of. So is that and a if after the end of that syllable or two syllable word, just out of curiosity. It'll be a single syllable oh, word. So that's hard. Like cat, hat, mat, mm -hmm. cat, sat, right? So. Okay. And a lot of them sound like other words. So that's just also like the I just tricky said, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And so they have to get, if so people are looking at their audiogram right now, it's 60%. If, if, if the numbers are around or below 60% on that percentage, or they're not even measured, which we see some outside audiograms with that, they could come in to be considered mm -hmm. for a clear implant, correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so just out of curiosity in that study, so of all of those people who came in and, you know, met the 60-60 rule, what percentage of them actually ended up being candidates for cochlear implant? 95. Wow. So that's a lot. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty darn yeah, it was, And It's pretty predictable, yes. Did they go up any, like if the pure tone average was a little bit better? So in hearing... The lower the number, the better the hearing, because it means they didn't have to turn it up as much for you to be able to hear it, because the number is how loud they had to make it for you to hear it. So um, it, 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 did they find that it really fell off if people had a pure tone average of 50 dB or something like that? They said there was only 10 or 12 patients who had a PTA that was lower than 60 that were actually cochlear implant candidates that they found. So it's a pretty so good scooping off. net, right? So, so people could mm -hmm. take their hearing test, look at it, kind of take the average of 500 hertz, which is cycles per second, 1,000 hertz and 2,000 hertz, add them all up, divide by three. If that's greater than 60, they should probably consider coming in. Or if yeah. their understanding is 60% in, is that in one ear, both ears? Uh, how does that? One ear. Just in one ear. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So. You come in, all right, so now that's a great rule, right? Because not only can patients kind of do it themselves, um, but so can some of our colleagues who are treating people with hearing technology. So our hearing aid uh, dispenser and dispensing audiology colleagues can use this as a guideline, right, to send patients, right? Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. that doesn't determine if they're a cochlear implant candidate, right? No, no. there's so, a lot of stuff that goes into right. determining if they are a cochlear implant candidate. And since we're all on the same team, we know that it's not just the hearing, right? There's a whole bunch of other stuff, and we might talk about that in another episode. But from a hearing point of view, okay, so I come in, I have, you know, I meet the 60-60 rule. You come in, first thing we do is, is we're like carpenters, right? So carpenters measure twice and cut once, right? So we actually, the first thing we do is we'll validate that hearing test to make sure that we're in agreement of that finding. But that's still... We'll only say whether or not you meet the 60-60 rule. So 
as you know, and I know in our, our organization, we do what we call a cochlear implant evaluation, right? And so they, that is a separate appointment where people come in and we're trying to determine if they are from a hearing point of view, a cochlear implant candidate or not, right? And so what does that in, entail, that test? Or testing, it's not a single test necessarily, right? So audiologically, we want to test their like word recognition and like the best aided condition to see if they get benefit from hearing aids. Um, if they don't meet that criteria, then we will bring them back for a cochlear implant seminar to make sure um, that they understand what a cochlear implant is. Right. Um, but within like the audiological testing, like we will fit them with our hearing aids to see like, hey, are these hearing aids like benefiting them? Are they not benefiting them? Like, how are they doing with a non-surgical approach? Right. And if they're doing well with a non-surgical approach, then we are obviously going to go that route because we don't want everybody to go through surgery and we will set them up with a hearing aid evaluation because what we're finding is a lot of these patients are underfit. Um, and we want them to hear the best way possible, but of course we don't want to put them to, through surgery. So. Um, if we can, so cochlear implant them the best for, way for a patient if hearing aids don't work. Not, yes, not exactly. I don't like my hearing aids or not. Hearing aids are too expensive. Those aren't the answers. Right. The answer is if hearing aids don't work. And so it's not whether or not your hearing aids don't work. It's whether or not what we consider very well programmed hearing aids don't work. And so I do. I say to patients like, look, you know, you come in. I can look at your ear. I can talk to you. I can look at your hearing test. But to me, the big black box of your hearing experience is what's going on in your hearing aid because I can't look at the programming. And we don't do that. We just take our own hearing aids, program them, and test them in what we consider the best aided condition, right? Right. Because we just want people to hear well. Yeah, like, no, I get it. And so it is a little bit different though, right? Because do you test one ear or the two ears together? We separate the two ears and then we do them also together. Right, because so we are the, really analyzing which all your hearing is well. Yes, mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, we just want you to hear as best as possible. Right, and so what I say to people is like the hearing test is like an EKG, right? Like it just says, "Hey, you're." Let me tell you the status of your heart, and like the uh, CI evaluation, the cochlear implant evaluation is like a stress test, right? Like so. If they really want to know how well your heart's working, we put people on a treadmill and we see if their heart can do exercise. So we're really stressing people because it's not just with hearing aids. Like we do some stuff in the environment too. What, what do we do, Rachel? Like what do we do in the environment uh, in terms of when we test them? So the testing usually starts off in quiet, but we know the real world is not quiet. So then we'll put you in some background noise. And that's where we really see people struggle a lot is it with background noise, which is an everyday environment. If you, even if you just go outside, there's road noise. Right. But then when you go to a restaurant and you're really trying to interact with family and there's noise around you and they just can't do it. Yeah, so testing them in more, it is a lot. Hmm. So testing them more in a real world environment by adding background noise really gives us a better idea of how they're doing functionally when they leave us with those hearing aids. No, that, that, that's great. So we're really, uh, and I, to touch back to some of the thing you were saying, Lindsay, I think, you know, it is important for people to understand. We don't just say, well, we're just going to do surgery and we're just going to put devices in your, your ear. The answer is, is we do that when a hearing aid doesn't give you what you need. Now, some people hearing aids, they might do well with them and they're not satisfied. And we're okay with that. Like I always say to people like, you know, it's okay if you don't like chocolate ice cream, but you know, that's a taste issue. But if we give you chocolate ice cream, we give you chocolate ice cream, right? You see what I'm saying? Like there can be people who are dissatisfied with their communication, even though we demonstrate that they're, they're hearing well. Right. Yeah. right. And so, all right. So hallelujah. Okay. Uh, we go through this testing and that testing takes about how long? It takes about an hour. Okay. So, you know, it's an investment and then you talk a little bit about it. All right. So at that point you basically decide, Oh, Hearing aids are the answer for you or cochlear implants are the answer for you. And so we'll leave the hearing aid thing alone. We, we send them to some of our colleagues who are excellent at hearing care from a hearing aid technology point of view. We would pass them off and say, look, you're not a cochlear implant candidate yet. That's what I always say to people because hearing loss, you know, it's a progressive disease. 
And that's one of the things we're checking all the time. So I, I tell people like, look, you know, you come in this year, you're not a cochlear implant candidate. We'll see you back next year and we'll see it. Or if you have a sudden change, we want to know, right? But so they, somebody is a cochlear implant candidate and then you started talking about it, Lindsay. So just an overall about the process. I, I tell patients like, look, you know, um, when we tell you you're a cochlear implant candidate or we explain a cochlear implant is an option to people, I tell people they don't know enough to say they want one and they don't know enough to say they don't want one, right? Like, it's like, you don't really know anything about it. So we try to educate them to, to tell, tell the audience a little bit about that process. Yes. So we are, take a very like holistic approach. We try not to like lead people into one way or another. So we will give them all the educational tools that they need to um, educate themselves as far as like the different cochlear implant companies that are out there. Um, of course, the cochlear implant companies are in like the sales category and they're going to tell you that one is better than the other. There's no research out there that shows that one company is better than the other. Everybody performs the same. Um, so we really just want um, our patients to determine what works best for them and their lifestyle. Um, and we will work with all three of them. Both Rachel and I are very comfortable with all three of the manufacturers. There's soon to be four. We will be all comfortable with four. Um, so that's totally up to you and what you feel like is best for you and your lifestyle. Um, again, there's no research that shows that one company is better than the other. We, Rachel and I will make sure that you are hearing the best way possible. Um, but we also want to make sure that your expectations are realistic. So again, it takes up to a year to get the benefits that you want to out of or it. Or even it's longer, some people, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not a quick fix. Um, I know that you guys will YouTube a lot of this and you'll think that it just gets slapped on your head and everything is great, but it takes a lot of work. It's a long, it's a long process. Um, but again, Rachel and I at Arizona Hearing Center, along with Dr. Sims, we're here for the whole process. We will see you throughout that entire year to make sure that you are programmed the way that you want to be programmed. Um, but on the backside, you also have to be willing to do the work as far as like listening therapy, hearing therapy. If you're not progressing the way that we want you to progress, we will also recommend um, a speech language pathologist to move you along. Um, but again, what do we have? 580? Yeah, around there. Yes. So we've been doing this with a lot of patients. Yeah. <laughs> um, so at the end of the day, we will make sure that you are hearing the way you want to. Yeah, I tell patients, you know, it's like going to the music store and getting the violin, right? So we hand you the violin, but that doesn't mean you know how to play it, right? So you need a music teacher. You need to learn how to read music. You have to practice. There's all the stuff. It's not like putting an app into your head you know, like on your phone or on your computer and just saying, oh, I uploaded a cochlear implant and now I can hear. So, but I think, you know, we touched on one thing, which I think is really, if there's any takeaway for patients is we want you to hear better. And that's what you said, Lindsay, and I, and I agree hundred mm -hmm. percent. And so really what this comes down to is, is the rule is very useful, but if people aren't hearing well, we can evaluate your hearing. We can evaluate your current technology and we can talk to them about, um, how they can hear better. So, you know, there are a couple of questions I always ask um, most people who are on this. So the, the first question I always ask people is, and, you know, whoever gets to go first, I guess, is on the spot a little bit more, is, you know, it's, uh, you're at an award ceremony, they're honoring you, who do you thank? Like, so when you want to thank the people in your life who have helped you, who do you thank? Uh, whichever one you want to go first. I would like to thank Dr. Sims. Oh, cut it out. No, seriously. <laughs> In your life. I, mean, I appreciate that. I think we have a great team and I really appreciate it, guys. But no, but like honestly, like if I were at an awards ceremony, like you guys would be the one that I think I've been in like the cochlear implant industry for a very long time. And I've seen people do things that are very like unethical to me. Right. Um and so like, if I were at an awards ceremony, like I'm not saying this. Oh, I appreciate that. I'm not getting a bonus for this. Uh, right, right, Rachel, um, but rocks. like you guys would, well, we're, yeah, we're great. You guys would be the one that I think, because I oh, feel like you. you guys 
do the right thing. And I've been in this for like 10 years. I think we always try to do the right Right. thing. How about you, Rachel? Right. Oh, who would I think? Um, I would think my work environment here, for sure, everyone that I work with, because I couldn't do without Dr. Sims or Lindsay or our front office. I would not get anything done without our front office because all I'd be doing is answering the phone. (laughs) So they are great. (laughs) (laughs) I would also probably thank my undergraduate professor, Dr. Diefendorf, who really pushed me to stay in the field and not just leave it. That's great. And then the last question I love to ask, this is a new one. What's your favorite sound? My favorite sound? My favorite sound is thunderstorms and rain, which we don't get here. So I do miss that coming from the The beating of point shoots. Yep. Point ah. shoes. Oh, when you crack, crack your point it, shoes, yeah. cracking the shank. Oh, that's that's great. <laughs> My favorite sound. <laughs> Mine's laughter. So, yes. there you go. Well, yeah. we have a lot of that here. Yeah, we, we do. do. We do. And so we <laughs> we're serious, but we have fun. So that's great. So, yes. you guys, uh, I I appreciate it. You know, um, usually I say, where can people get a hold of you? So we all know it's at www.azhere.com or six zero two three zero seven nine nine one nine. This has been great. I really appreciate you guys coming on. And uh, hopefully people will start using the 60-60 rule and uh, they can get a pathway to better hearing. Because that's really, we want people to hear better. And there are a lot of people, unfortunately, who aren't, who could. So thanks for coming on, guys, and have a great day. Okay. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.